Hey guys, so today's video lecture topic is going to be about the cell membrane and how it is used for cell transport. As always, please make sure you are filling in your notes organizer as you watch the video, being sure to complete all questions, including the Venn diagram at the back so that you can use your notes um, for your homework check. So we have to start by talking about a really important structure, and that is the cell membrane. So let's quickly review what is the difference between the cell membrane and the cell wall. Remember, not all cells have cell walls, but all cells have cell membranes. So even cells that have cell walls, like plant cells, for example, they have the cell wall on the outside, and then the cell membrane still acting as a barrier just inside that. Okay, so all cells have cell membranes, which act as a flexible barrier on the outside of a cell, and its main job is to maintain homeostasis within the cell. Remember, homeostasis is that stable internal environment, and it does that by controlling what goes in and out of the cell. So even though the cell wall is on the outside of the cell membrane, its job is to provide structure and support. It's still the cell membrane's job to control what goes in and out of the cell. Okay, so the, the cell membrane goes by many names. Sometimes you'll hear it called the cell membrane. Sometimes you'll hear it called the plasma membrane. Sometimes you'll hear it called the phospholipid bilayer. They all mean the same structure, okay? You will hear the overall structure of a cell membrane described as a phospholipid bilayer. Bilayer meaning two layers. So it is two layers of phospholipids, and we'll talk about those in a second, and then there are like these embedded proteins within the phospholipid layer. That is the overall structure of the cell membrane, a phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins. Okay, so these are the phospholipids right here. They look like this. So there's two layers of these structures. And each phospholipid has a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. Now, if you remember, we know the word hydrophobic. We learned about that when we talked about lipids. So this is the lipid portion of the phospholipid. So the hydrophilic head, the um, phospho portion of the phospholipid, is water loving. It attracts water. The fatty acid tails, the lipid portion, are hydrophobic. They're water fearing, meaning they repel water. So half of the cell membrane is constantly attracting water. The other half of the cell membrane is constantly repelling water. So there's this constant push and pull of water, which is one of the reasons why the cell membrane is really good at letting things in and out of it, right? Because it can very easily move water across the membrane. So small things can pass through the cell membrane really easily for three reasons. Because of that constant push and pull of water, because the phospholipids sort of make because of the way they're structured, they sort of leave little holes naturally. Okay, we call that being porous. So the cell membrane is porous in nature. So small things can kind of squeeze between those phospholipids. And those phospholipids are constantly kind of vibrating, which creates these, you know, openings um, naturally in between them that things can pass through. Okay, so small materials can pass through really easily. That's going to be really important in just a second. Now, the cell membrane is cool because there are all these things embedded within it, all these structures, and the cell membrane is really flexible. So it's constantly bending and flexing, and all of those things that are embedded in it are constantly kind of floating with the flexibility of the membrane. So we call this, this is explained by what we call the fluid mosaic model, okay? It explains the structure of the cell membrane that these proteins and these other materials float within the cell membrane. When you think about a pool, if a pool has a lot of floats in it, and then all of a sudden you get the waves going, all those floaties are kind of, you know, doing this with the waves. That's exactly what all these proteins and materials that are embedded within the cell membrane are doing as the cell membrane continues to flex and bend. Okay, so here is the structure of the cell membrane. We will spend time in class going over what the function of each of these parts are, but for now, pause on this slide and label your picture showing the structures found within the cell membrane. So its overall structure is a phospholipid bilayer. Then we have these different parts, okay? We have proteins that are embedded. Some of them are only on one side of the membrane. Some of them go all the way through. Those are called tra transport or channel proteins. Some of those proteins have carbohydrate chains attached to them. And in between some of the fatty acid tails, you'll find some cholesterol. So label that picture. Okay, so remember, the cell membrane's function is the bouncer or the gatekeeper of the cell. It controls what goes in and out. Now, it's really good at its job, and it only allows things that are supposed to be coming in, in, and it only allows things that are supposed to be going out, out. So generally speaking, it lets nutrients in and waste out. So but because it only allows certain materials in and out of the cell, we call it a semi-permeable barrier. Semi meaning somewhat, permeable meaning able to pass through. So only some things are able to pass through. So it's semi-permeable. 
Okay, the, the term that is used to describe the movement of materials in and out of the cell is called cell transport. So that's what we're moving on to next, how the cell membrane is used for cell trans transport, the movement of materials in and out of the cell. Now, there are two types of cell transport, okay? So remember, it's the movement of materials in and out of the cell, and this can either be passive or active. And the biggest difference between passive cell transport and active cell transport is that passive cell transport does not require the use of energy. Active cell transport does require the use of energy. So fill out your little concept map, define cell transport. Now let's talk a little bit more about why doesn't passive transport require energy and active transport does. So passive transport, it's passive, doesn't require energy. This is what molecules want to do. Molecules want to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. They don't want to be all jumbled together. They want to spread out as much as they can. So they travel with what we call with the concentration gradient naturally, meaning they travel from high to low. It's kind of like swimming downstream, right? That's what we want to do. That's what molecules want to do. So that doesn't take any energy, okay? So I've got this little image here of, of this guy rolling a, rolling a rock down a hill. Going from high to low, this is easy. It doesn't take any work, doesn't take any energy. The examples of passive transport, so the movement of materials from high to low, are diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. And we're going to talk about each one of those. Then we have active transport, which is the opposite. This requires the use of energy because it's what molecules don't want to do. They do not want to move from an area where they're at a low concentration to an area where they're going to be at a higher concentration. It's smashed all together, right? So we call that going against the concentration gradient. This would be like swimming upstream. Okay, this is not what we want to do. It requires a lot of work, right? This guy's saying, ah, this is hard work moving that rock up the hill. So from low, too high, that is active transport, requires the use of energy. So our examples of active transport would be endocytosis and exocytosis. And again, we're going to talk about each one of those. So going back to passive transport, we have three types, diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. Diffusion is simply the movement of these small particles from high to low until equilibrium is reached. When you put food coloring or you know you drop one of those food tabs when you're um, dying easter eggs into water or vinegar or whatever it is and they start spreading out and diffusing until eventually the whole jar is full of that um, color that is an example of diffusion when you spray air freshener or when you spray perfume when you first spray it those molecules that are, are at a really high concentration but they're going to naturally move from a high concentration and diffuse to where they spread out as much as they can which is why if i spray perfume in my classroom okay the front people in the front row, row would smell it first but eventually the people in the back row would smell it too because those molecules are going to diffuse until they reach a point where they've diffused as much as they can right we call that equilibrium Okay, so here is, um, you know, what a cell would look like before diffusion happens. You can see these molecules, they're at a high concentration outside, they're at a lower concentration inside, so they would diffuse across the cell membrane until eventually we reach the state of equilibrium, where they're equal inside and outside of the cell. Diffusion happens with particles that are small enough to pass through that porous membrane. Remember, the, the cell membrane um, has this natural structure for allowing small things to pass through it. Okay, so that does not require energy when they are traveling from high to low. That is simple diffusion. Okay, then we have osmosis. I'm going to move this so we can see the title here. Um, which is just a specific type of diffusion. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a semipermeable membrane. So it's still diffusion, still going from high concentration to low concentration, does not require energy. It's just a type of diffusion that's so important that we give it its own name. The diffusion of water is so important that we give it its own name and it is called osmosis. Okay, so here's the cell membrane. These are our water molecules here. So eventually, through osmosis, they would diffuse across the cell membrane until eventually they reach a state of equilibrium, traveling from high to low, still no energy. Um, so if we had a beaker and we stuck some sugar molecules on one side and a lot of sugar molecules on another side and some water, okay, look at our percentages here. This side has 25% sugar, 75% water, 60% sugar, and 40% water. If we stuck a semi-permeable membrane in between those two sides, you would see that water would actually pass through to the other side until eventually you have 50% sugar and 50% water on both sides, okay? The water is trying to diffuse 
and reach a state of equilibrium, so diffuse from where it is high to where it is low through the process of osmosis. Now, when you put a cell into various solutions, water is going to move in and out of the cells depending on what type of solution that they are, they are put in. Okay, so um, here are some examples of how they can move, and we're going to talk about each of these solutions. So depending on if you're putting a cell into an isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic solution, water is going to move through osmosis in various ways. If you put a cell into an isotonic solution, that means that there is equal amounts of solute both in and out of the cell. So water is going to move in equal amounts in and out of the cell, which means the cell is not going to change size. Cells love to be in isotonic solutions, okay? Blood cells love to be in isotonic solutions. Equal amounts of water moving in and out through osmosis. If you put a cell into a hypertonic solution, you are putting a cell into a place where there is a higher concentration of solute outside of the cell than inside of the cell. So the water inside of the cell is going to try and, and diffuse outside of the cell through osmosis to kind of even things out which is going to cause the cell to shrink or shrivel in size. This is how I always remember it, and this might not be politically correct, but a really hyper person is always skinny, right? So if you see hypertonic solution, the cell is going to get skinny. It is going to shrivel because water is going to be leaving the cell. In a hypotonic solution, so if you put a cell into a hypotonic solution, there is a higher concentration of solute inside the cell than outside, so water is going to diffuse into the cell through osmosis, which is going to make the cell get bigger and expand, and sometimes they can even burst. If you look back at these red blood cells, okay, if you put a red blood cell into a hypotonic solution, the red blood cell can burst, which we know is not good, right? Um, so I always remember hypotonic because in a hypotonic solution, cells get as big as a hippo. So hypotonic solution, cells get big like a hippo. They expand. Okay, then we have facilitated diffusion, which is another type of passive transport. It's still diffusion. It's still molecules moving from high to low. The only difference is that these are molecules that are a little bit too large to squeeze through that porous membrane. So they have to be helped or facilitated through the membrane by traveling through these channel proteins and carrier proteins. So a glucose molecule is a little bit too big to squeeze through these phospholipids, so they're just going to travel um, through these helper proteins, but it still doesn't take any energy. It's still traveling from high to low, so it's an example of passive transport. Okay, so again, sometimes um, different protein channels will just be like a bridge where they kind of slide through. Other carrier proteins have this like squeezing, pumping mechanism that they use to move the molecules in and out. But again, moving from high to low it does not take any energy. It's a type of passive transport. We just have to be helped along by traveling through these um, proteins. Okay, so now we're going on to active transport. So remember, active transport does require the use of energy because you're do making molecules do what they don't want to do, which is move from low to high against the concentration gradient. Our two types of active transport are endocytosis and exocytosis. In endocytosis, this is when you need to move large molecules into the cell. So think about what that might be. The most common thing would be food, right? A cell wants to take in food, even though it's big, and even though they're moving things from low to high, they need the food, so they're going to use what's called endocytosis. What happens is the molecule bumps into the cell membrane, or the cell membrane bumps into the, let's say it's food or whatever, and the cell membrane actually wraps around and engulfs the particle, because remember the cell membrane is very flexible, and it pinches off into a temporary vesicle or vacuole to go to wherever it needs to go to in the cell for digestion. Okay, it comes into the cell, endocytosis, Okay, so this is a large part particles moving from low to high, so it's going to require energy. It's active transport. Okay, an example would be uh, moving carbon dioxide to blood vessels where their carbon dioxide is already high, but getting them to the lungs so that you can exhale the carbon dioxide. Or an amoeba bumping into something tasty. Okay, they're going to take that in even though it's going to take some energy to do it. And then exocytosis is the opposite, the movement of large molecules out of the cell. So again, moving from low to high, but it's got to be done. This is typically how we move waste, right? Requires energy. And um, the Golgi body plays a major role in this. 
Okay, so it will pinch off, remember the Golgi body is a set of membranes, it will pinch off some of that membrane to form these temporary vesicles and bring them to the cell membrane, and again, it will blend with the cell membrane, the cell membrane will flex and release that out into the um, outside of the cell environment. Okay, that does take energy, it's moving from low to high, so it is active transport.